They told my parents, your son's got ADD and OCD. He needs to be on Ritalin. Basically, I'm a dumb kid. And they said, that's why you're not doing good in school. You've got ADD and OCD. Take these pills. I later reframed that, rewrote the story that ADD and OCD are my superpower. Yes. Because when I find the thing that I'm going to be fucking locked onto, yes. you cannot unlock me from. Welcome to the Fitness CEO Podcast. Hey, welcome back, friends, to another amazing episode of the Fitness CEO Podcast. A new month. I'm back with my man, B. Welcome to the show, my friend. Man, good to be back. Miss being on the show. Here we are. All righty. Well, today's episode is about stop being a entrepreneur, and it's time to get off the sidelines into action because let's face it, um, if you're a business owner, if you're a professional, if you're a person um, who has any sort of ambitions, you've probably had those ambitions, but there's this little thing, this fear, this uh, little voice in the back of your mind, kind of for whatever reason, giving you that resistance to take the next step. So hopefully this episode is going to provide some inspiration, some insight, and also some action steps yeah. for our audience. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. And by the way, that little voice you're talking about, we all have it. And that voice is called your inner critic. You know, it's this, um, at the project, we call it your inner bitch, yeah. right? There's this inner negative voice, the critic, the inner bitch who says you can't, you shouldn't, what if, uh, you embarrass yourself, you lose it all. Is it the right time? You've never done this before. You don't have an education in this. And so that critic never runs out of ammunition, but the only way we can silence the critic is by giving more voice to the inner advocate. Because there's also that other voice within us, right? I know I can do this. I'm meant for more. I, 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 I deserve success. I think my time is now. Like, what is that other inner voice? But we don't tend to feed that wolf. We always feed the negative wolf. Yes. And whatever wolf we feed is the one that grows. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll shine some light through my own personal examples yeah. and through some coaching clients on how we've been able to silence the critic and give greater voice to the advocate. Um, so I guess as we keep going here, we can talk about it or I can maybe just jump into it now. Why don't you jump into that? Yeah. So I think one of the fastest ways to turn up the volume on your inner advocate, your, your built-in cheerleader. Like imagine that. Everyone's got a built-in built cheerleader, cheerleader, right? Yeah. Like that believes in you, yeah. that knows you can do it, that says you deserve more. But I always metaphorically do it this way. I go, if our body is a vehicle, we're driving this car, we're never alone. There's always two other passengers in the car with us, the, the critic and the advocate. The critic is that inner bitch voice, then, then gives you negative feedback, tells you you can't, uses fear, doubt, uncertainty as fuel. And then the advocate is like, hey man, but don't, don't you think you're meant for more? Don't you think you're different? Don't you think that you deserve? Aren't you, don't you want to thrive off inspiring others? And don't you want to make more money, have freedom and, and have, have some legacy? Now, we want that, but the fear of failure. And there's another fear of success. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The other fear of success. Let's talk about that because I have a list of five things that I've felt and, or I've heard from coaching clients over mm -hmm. the course of time about that's this, this inner, inner bitch, if you will. But from your lens, the fear of success, the that's fear not, of success, it's, it's real. It, it is real. So let's talk about it. Okay. So fear of success is really the Imposter syndrome. The only way I could really define fear of success is the imposter syndrome. Anytime we haven't done anything new, yeah. it's scary, right? Like imagine this, I you know, started off building Fit Body Bootcamp and then built a coaching business and then um, had the Fitness Business Summit. Yes. A big mega event for 11, 11 years we ran that. It was like a three day mega wedding. It's the only way I could describe it. 1500 gym owners from worldwide coming to Costa Mesa for three days, I would give a Land Rover to one of the audience yeah. members, right? Like it was a big to do. It cost like half a million dollars to put that event on. We did it for 11 years. I was excited. But the moment I sat down to write my book, Man Up, uh -huh. the critic started to speak to me. Dude, Ooh. you've never written a book. You're not an author. What makes you think that you can have a book that's successful? People are going to read that and they're going to laugh at you. It's going to be forever mem memorialized that you are not an author. And so... Fear, I had fear of success, even though I had proven track record of success by building Fit Body Bootcamp and Fit Pro Newsletter before that, a coaching business that was making millions of dollars, Fitness Business Summit, a live event. But the one thing I hadn't done yet, authoring a book, I felt like an imposter and therefore I was afraid of that success. Ooh. And so people always ask them, what do I do? I go, well, you need to go back and listen to your inner advocate. If you ask your inner advocate, why do I deserve success as an author? The advocate would say, well, Bedros, you have this track record 
of irrefutable success. Fitness Business Summit, Fit Pro Newsletter, Coaching Business, Fit Body Boot Camp. And therefore, you've got evidence, undeniable evidence, that you are good at what you do when you put your mind to it. Yes, it comes with setbacks and, and sometimes two steps forward, three steps back, but you end up making it. And therefore, you will have your setbacks here as an author, but you will make it. The problem is we get so caught up into the inner critic that we don't even stop to question the advocate. And this is what Napoleon Hill does really well when he speaks to the devil in his book, Outwitting the, the devil, devil, right? We forget that we are just as human meat sack. Consciousness lives within us. Consciousness literally has the voice of the advocate and the critic. If we just ask the advocate, like, can you give me evidence that I'm a badass, that I'm a winner, that I deserve success, that I can do this? It will point to all your past successes, assuming that you've had them. Now, if you're someone that's always quit, gave up too early, threw in the towel, it will try and point to successes. It won't find it. It'll just shrug. Yeah. And therefore, you will hear the voice of the critic. But when you can stack irrefutable amounts of undeniable success over stacked over time, when you come to that place of wanting to do something new as an entrepreneur, and you'll go, you, you will launch versus the person who hasn't stacked any previous success in life. And that success could show up as weight loss, as just saying that I'm gonna wake up on time every morning at 5.30 without hitting the snooze button. Like it doesn't have to be a success like I made $10 million, right? It could be, I keep my word to myself. I wake up at 5.30, I do a gratitude journal, or I you know, drink 30 ounces of water every day and I've been doing this for two years straight, mm -hmm. or whatever the wins are. When you stack success over time, it compounds into confidence. And that's what's missing for most people. Dude, so true. And I think that stacking win has is, is been you know, instrumental in my life. And yeah. the, the, the highest performers, you know, at Fit Body Bootcamp, our franchise partners, like this, the same thing. Now, flipping back to the fear of failure, because we talked about the fear of success. I want to kind of break this down. And, for, and this is kind of my mental framework that ultimately has really like allowed me to overcome that feel of failure uh, because it's true. It's real. We all, we all feel it right. For me, um, what I've learned actually from a marketing framework, what I've realized is, uh, in marketing, everything's a test at the end of the day, even you or I like really strong marketers. Yeah. We have probably a good idea of what's going to be successful or fail uh, or, or not. But at the end of the day, do we truly know? No, it's actually, we're, I'm talking with Lauren or he's, she's in the studio right now. Once a month, we basically have a meeting from our marketing team and we analyze what content actually popped, what content didn't. And then we can actually reverse engineer and glean those lessons mm -hmm. there. So from that uh, framework, if you actually look at it from any new endeavor, any business that you're going to launch, anything, any challenge that you're going to go through. If you look at it, it's not ultimately you know, do or die. It's just a test. And at the end right. of the day, like if it fails, you're going to pivot and then adjust course and then you know, achieve more success. Yeah. That's a mental framework that has really allowed me to overcome that feel of failure, that inner critic, if you will, when times get tough. You nailed it. You nailed it by saying it's not do or die. And the inner critic is so good. Our, our negative voice in our head is so good at making everything black and white. Yeah, Dude, you might fail and it's going to be embarrassing and you're going to lose it all. When in reality, I have failed in business. I have failed with Fit Body, or not Fit Body Bootcamp, with High Tech Trainer, Yeah, my first business. I had so many business partners, we spent so much money, I was barely making anything. I was in debt to Jim Franco, my mentor, and I paid him back every penny with 8% interest, right? And that was a great lesson to learn. But it didn't, it didn't end my marriage. It didn't, I didn't, we didn't end up losing our tiny little house that we bought when I first got married. In my head, the fear of failure made me feel like Diana's gonna leave me, because I didn't make high-tech trainers successful. We might lose our house. This will be embarrassing when people hear that high-tech trainer wasn't successful. Guess what? There was no news article or press release put out that high-tech trainer uh, was led by Bedros Koulian and it was an absolute flop. My wife is still with me and loves me. We kept that house and it ultimately became one of our rental properties. And so, but the critic is so black and white that it doesn't go like, hey, uh, okay, so you might end up failing, which is just, what entrepreneurs do feedback and failure by the way we just need to reframe as temporary defeat it's just feedback yeah you nailed it in all marketing you look for the failures because you realize that i'm one step closer to the one successful campaign that's going to make me the money get me the clients get me the leads i think it was benjamin franklin right who or who, who thomas edison mm -hmm. like uh, how many failures did he have before he created the light filament yeah. tens of thousands, thousands. 
He had to have those, but each it's only failure when you look at it as black and white. Otherwise, it's temporary defeat knowing that, okay, I'm running out of filament material. So it might, might be this very last one. It just might be this very last one. The 10,000 filament might be the one that actually conducts electricity. And sure enough, it may have been, or maybe he had 20 more to go. I don't know. But the lesson here is fear of failure is so black and white that we begin to get consumed by it when we realize it's actually many, many shades of light gray and you're just going to look at it as temporary defeat, take a step or two back, regroup, and come back. And the lessons I learned through High Tech Trainer is what helped Fit Body Bootcamp become a success. I realized I don't need all those business partners. I don't need to go into big debt. I can work off a shoestring budget. Mm -hmm. I can follow a process that exists. It's your advantage. It actually becomes an yeah. advantage. Yeah. But it's, again, reframing it to an advantage versus a living off the fear of it. Yeah, amen to that. Um, the second, um, you know, feedback that I get from, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, you know, coaching clients that uh, really inhibit them from taking that next step is really comes down to the financial constraints. I hear this all the time, but for me, B, it's so interesting. That is the biggest fallacy because if you look at any entrepreneur, okay, I look back at my journey when I first started launching my uh, Fit Body Bootcamp, I thought I had financial constraints. At the end of the day, an entrepreneur will always have financial constraints. A guy like me now, fast forward 12 years, multimillionaire, I still have financial constraints because guess what? The appetite, the vision, basically the things that we want to continue attack. Same with you, B. Mm -hmm. All the success that you've had, at the end of the day, when you break it down, an entrepreneur creates creativity and adds value to the marketplace. So there's never no shortage for a true red entrepreneur, a different ideas and value they can take in the marketplace. So it doesn't matter. It could literally be The Rock or Cristiano Ronaldo. At the end of the day, those guys have financial constraints on the next project they want to execute. So for me, that's been like a really mental shift that I always felt I had financial constraints, but I realized it doesn't matter how much success I have. I will always, because I'm always trying to get in the creation mode and the value add mode. So that's my framework. I'm curious on your perspective. Well, it's funny that the, the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur will always wait for the right perfect time. And all that is what you described is procrastination. So, you know, gosh, when my financial constraints are better, I will launch as an entrepreneur. When the economy is better, I will launch as an entrepreneur. When we have a better president, I will launch as an entrepreneur. When my wife gives me the green light, I will launch as an entrepreneur. When everything is, all my debts are paid off, I will launch as an entrepreneur. And then we end up missing so many great opportunities that have opened. The entrepreneur wants everything perfect to launch, not realizing that it's just a form of procrastination. Whereas the entrepreneur says, look, I know that there is no perfect time. I must lean into imperfect action. I realize that I've gathered enough information to know that this business model is going to work. The economy is not ideal. The president is not ideal. My financial situations are not ideal, but I will persevere and push through and FIO, figure it out. And I'm convinced, and allow me to get a little woo-woo here, Please. Bryce. I'm convinced that when we decide to figure things out and leap into action, because perfect doesn't exist, so imperfectly take action, the universe begins to collude with us and goes, you know what, this guy is not a entrepreneur, this guy is an entrepreneur, I'm gonna create opportunities for him to get more money, for the timing to improve, for that building to become available. But if you're just waiting, the universe also colludes and goes, you're waiting, I'm just gonna have you wait longer. I'm always gonna put things in your wait to seem imperfect, for you to never launch, 10 years will go by, and you'll be like, man, that could have been me. I can't tell you how many people tell me like, I had the idea of Fit Body Bootcamp, I had the idea of, you did, well how come you didn't launch with it, but I launched with it in the depth of the housing market crash in 2010, 2011, when everyone else was contracting, mm -hmm. I was willing to take the risks. So I deserve the spoils. That's just a reality. Truth. It actually leads us to the next one, which is actually the recession. So the president clearly is not ideal. The financial markets are clearly not ideal right now. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty, but at the end of the day, to your point, it's about taking action. And from my lens, if you're an average uh, business owner, you should not be opening your business in, in a recession. But let me take that step back for a second. If you're an average business owner, you shouldn't be launching a business anyway. So at the end of the day, if you want to be successful and you want to latch yourself on a fit body or any different 
different program or business opportunity out there, you got to come in with the mindset that not only gonna be, I'm going to survive, I'm going to thrive. And for me, um, with the recession, whether good, bad, financial economy, it doesn't matter. To your point, that's a, it's an area of procrastination, and it really limits the people who are basically just sitting on the sidelines waiting for all the perfect, basically, elements. And I use this analogy. You would not get in your car, B. We just had dinner on Friday night. It was awesome. Celebrate, you know, Di's uh, birthday. We wouldn't get in our car and be like, you know what? I need to wait till all the lights are green right. in order for me to get in the freeway to go to the restaurant. Oh, that's so perfect. That'd be ridiculous, yeah. right? But that's actually the same analogy what mo most, most entrepreneurs are thinking before they launch their business. So I had recession as a talk talking point, but uh, I'm curious if you're any other yeah, feedback well, there. Well, people also forget that the recession might be the best time, depending on the type of business, to launch a business. Because remember, we started Fit Body Bootcamp back in the depth of the housing market crisis. 2008, housing market crashed. Uh, unemployment was at the highest ever, 11.4%. It was 2010 that we started Fit Body Bootcamp as a licensing program. By 2012, we franchised. And let me interject here. I mean, I, I was just meeting you at this time. I was not in depth. I'm sure probably your family and friends were like, B, what the hell are you they doing right now? They thought I was now? out of my mind. Yeah, what are you doing right now, man? And just to give you a perspective, I didn't have enough money to convert Fit Body Bootcamp from a licensing program to a franchise. That was the first time me and Diana refinanced our new home that we just bought three years previous, right? So we refinanced our home to take out $80,000 to go through the, to hire the right attorney to, to franchise, got all the franchise documents, the FDD, the FA in, in order. So I didn't have the money. So if I waited for the perfect time, I might've been waiting five more years to franchise. But I was like, you know what? I believe in myself. I believe now is the time I'm going to pull money out of my house and franchise the brand. And that's what we did. Now, as it turns out, storefronts were available because so many businesses had gone out of business that landlords were willing to give a fit body bootcamp location franchisee a better deal on the rent they were offering TI, tenant improvement, like at a much better rate. That was me in 2012. I had six months free rent. Six like months free rent. Crazy rent freaking abatement. terms. When do you get rent abatement? Now, again, we're seeing, now Fit Body Bootcamp location owners are starting to get rent abatement again they're, because they're, there's a surplus of stores, storefronts available. So when someone's like, yeah, but also the economy, it's not in a good place. So what's the point of having a nice Fit Body Bootcamp and a, getting free rent and having the build out if you're not going to make money? I'm like, just look in the streets in your community. Are people still driving a BMW, a Mercedes? Are you still seeing Land Rovers? Yes. That means people are still making money. People yes. think that when there's a economic recession, everyone loses money. Right, it's not the case. And that's not the case. There's no. still plenty of people driving the higher end cars who are actually making money during a recession. I make money during recessions now. I'm, I made money during a recession. You made money during recession, and therefore, those people are still looking for a fitness solution. They're still looking for a better place to eat dinner. They're still looking. So whatever the business is, like if you are going to be a superior entrepreneur, like have a great product or service, which goes back to what you said, if you're just going to be an average business owner, never launch. Don't even launch when all the lights are green because you're going to fail. Because people can sniff out a mediocre business and word now through social media spreads so quickly, good or bad, mm -hmm. right? But if you're willing to like, hey, I'm gonna do a Fit Body Bootcamp location, I'm gonna follow their, their system to a T, and I'm just gonna be a savage franchisee, dude, you're gonna kill it. And if you're gonna kill it, then those people who are still making money in your community, driving the BMWs, the Mercedes, and the Land Rovers, they're gonna come and train there. And then when the economy does improve, the rest of the people will come and you will have a head start on everyone else. Amen to that, man. I just get fired up because I look at you, I look at me, I look at like some of the best businesses like, you know, in the last century have all basically launched in recessions and mm -hmm. thrive. So Hey there, my name is Bryce Henson, CEO of Fit Body Bootcamp, and you might know me as the host of this podcast, but what you might not know is that I started my fitness business journey as a Fit Body location owner. And since 2012, I've been able to impact my community while creating financial freedom, both for myself and my family too. You see, by using Fit Body's proven business model, we give you all the support and guidance you need to be your own boss and build a business that aligns with your passion for fitness. And being we are the absolute best at launching and scaling our friends franchise partners gyms, we are now excited to announce our 100 member guarantee. Now you might be thinking, Bryce, what is that? Well, we are so confident that we'll launch your Fit Body Bootcamp location with well over 100 paying members from day one on your grand opening that if we don't, 
We'll run your marketing till we do. That's how confident we are in our ability to support you and guide you through this process. So if you're interested in creating more income through Impact, click the link somewhere around this video to apply. My last one that I have to the table, B, um, the, the question that, you know, kind of embodies people and gives people this analysis paralysis, like, you know what, I, I want to do this, I want to launch a business, but I'm just afraid of what other people are going to think. Uh, so for me, I want to kind of dive in and I want to get your feedback. But I think, you know, taking a step back, there's a legitimate understanding of of, of human nature. We're tribal in be beings. And certainly back in the caveman days, it was extremely important you cared what other p your tribe thought. If, for example, um, you know, you weren't in, f in fair standing with your, your tribal community and you got cast out basically out of the cave, well, guess what? You are in a big amount of trouble with the saber tooth tiger coming. So genuinely speaking, years and decades and thousands of years ago, that was really important. But we're still factory installed in human nature to this day. But it's a mental framework that you have to understand that at the end of the day, if you fail, it's just feedback. You're going to move forward. And guess what? Okay? It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It only matters about the success for you, your family, and your community. So for me, it's kind of some tough love there. But you got to understand, hey, it's factory installed in human nature. But that's not going to actually take you to success. You just got to get over it. And by the way, dude, what everyone thinks is, is bullshit anyway. And here's why. I've told you this story, and I don't know if we've shared it on the podcast, but back in 2005, um, Diana's, we had just gotten married in 2003, so we were still broke. Diana was pregnant with Andrew, and Diana's family, her side of the family, offered to take everybody on a cruise to Alaska. And I was like, wow, okay, considering I'm never going to be able to afford a vacation anytime soon, I'm trying to launch a business, Yeah. like, hey, hun, let let's go on this cruise, right? So it was a cruise to Alaska, I'd never been on a cruise, good times. One of the ports, I think it was Ketchikan, Alaska, the, the cruise ship stops and we get off and we're walking around. We have all day to walk around before we get on the cruise ship. I'm seeing these fishermen casting out nets from the rocks, right? And they've got these like five gallon, what looks like a five gallon paint bucket next to them. And they're casting out nets and they'll wait, 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 and they'll pull the net. And sometimes it's empty. Sometimes there's like a little crab in there, right? The size of my hand. And so they'll put that crab in the bucket. And so they're crab fishermen. That's what they do all day long. And so I'm looking inside the bucket of one crab fisherman as he's doing his thing, casting out the net. There's like maybe five or six crabs in there at the bottom of the bucket. And mm -hmm. there was some water in there and the lid was off. Well, this one little ambitious crab was crawling on top of all the rest, real slow like crabs move. He was reaching up for the rim of the bucket and starting to hoist himself out. And so... I just, you know, the crab fisherman had his back to the bucket. So I said, hey, sir, you've got a little crab here that's about to make a getaway, right? <laughs> and he goes, he didn't even bother turning around. He goes, watch what happens next. As this little guy was trying to hoist himself out, all the other crabs in the bottom of the bucket reached up, grabbed it by its hind legs, and pulled it right down, right? And I realized in that moment that if I care what my friends and what everyone around me thinks, I'm gonna be that crab that's trying to go for success, but I'm constantly gonna get pulled down because the reality is, and this is the sad truth, most people don't wanna see you change. It threatens them when you change and improve for the better. Why? Because it shines a reflection that they have improvement to do, that they need to change, they need to transform, and they don't feel good about that. They're not ready to do the work right. where you are. That little crab was ready to escape to his freedom. The rest of the crabs, the four or five, six other crabs in the bucket, weren't quite ready yet. So they had to pull him down to their level. And so if we care about what everyone else thinks, we will never achieve what we want to achieve in life because there's always someone that's going to tell us it's not the right time. What if we lose money? And they're going to say it with the best of intention because they're usually the people closest to you, friends and family, coworkers, people who say they want the best for you. However, they're afraid to see you succeed because again, it shines the light on them. Mm -hmm. You're a reflection. Your success is a reflection of my failure is how they see it. Totally. Right? And so you have to sometimes just be that ambitious crab and shake them off. Unfortunately, that crab didn't. He got pulled down. But I realized in that moment that I've got crabs in my life and if I care about what they think, I'm allowing them to pull, them, pull me down. But if I just don't give a shit about what they think, I will climb over that bucket and win my freedom. And that's what I've done. Dude, amen to that. What a story. Um, I've heard you share that a few times over, never on the podcast. So friends, I hope that was valuable. Um, B, those are the things I wanted to bring to the table in terms of, you know, the, uh, 
perspectives and feedback over the years from, you know, um, coaching clients that really has enabled them to, um, or limited them to take that next step from your perspective. Uh, do you have any other others that you want to share? Yeah, I think the only other thing is like the story that people tell themselves, right? Like we all have this story that we've told in our, to ourselves in our head. And part of that story comes from the abuses that we've had, the traumas that we've experienced, the addictions, the, the you know, in my case, I was sexually molested as a kid when I was small in Armenia. And then we came to the United States and I was beat up by the local kids because I didn't speak English and understand the culture. And soon you start hearing them say, go back to your own effing country. You don't belong in this country. Your parents are taking all our great jobs and you begin to tell yourself a story that you're not worthy, that you're not capable, that you don't deserve. When in reality, what other people have done, whether hurt you, molested you, beat you, emotionally damaged you, um, bankrupt you, you got to at some point take the pen back and realize that you can't keep believing that story because it will limit you. It will create a seal that you won't be able to break through. If you take the pen back, you can go from today on, mm -hmm. I write the story because there's thousands of blank pages left in your book of life. Mm -hmm. If you just take the pen back, you can write how it goes. And I started to metaphorically write that this immigrant kid, actually the ADD and the OCD that they diagnosed me with when I came to Anaheim Union High School District, that's a gift. I've got ADD. That means that if you can't keep my attention, like I'm going to find something that I lock my attention on because I know when I do, that thing is my purpose and passion. So I realized very quickly, oh, well, he's got attention deficit. No, no, no. I'm deficit in attention if you can't keep my attention. Math, English, history, school it wasn't my thing, Yeah. right? We've talked about this, but when I found entrepreneurship, when I found fitness, when I decided I wanted to serve people through fitness and make money and be generous with my money, I locked on. All of a sudden, the ADD was like all my attention and now my OCD locks onto that goal and it becomes rocket fuel. And so I share that because what I had told myself because of the diagnosis that the Anaheim Union High School District nurses had given me was, they told my parents, your son's got ADD and OCD, he needs to be on Ritalin. I was like, basically I'm a dumb kid. And they said, that's why you're not doing good in school. You've got ADD and OCD, take these pills. I later reframed that, rewrote the story that ADD and OCD are my superpower. Yes. Because when I find the thing that I'm gonna be fucking locked onto, yes. you cannot unlock me from. Yes. And so if you're willing to rewrite your story and retell your story, you will blow up. If you believe this sad narrative that you've bought into, you will always suffer in mediocrity. Dude, amen to that. Uh, B, from my lens, uh, kind of my parting words in terms of action steps, uh, because I get this all the time. Like, Bryce, I want to take that next step. I'm afraid, like, the list of, like, eight things we went over today. And for me, something that served me well, and actually I'm going to pay you an accolade. Um, number one, writing down your goals. Writing down your uh, ambitions and basically putting pen to paper. When you do that, when you get that outside your mind, that's powerful. The second thing is actually finding someone you trust. And it's important you trust, especially in the infancy phase because we just talked about the crab story. There's a lot of people that want to see you win, but there's a lot of people that don't. Mm -hmm. um, and we just illustrated that. But when you find someone you trust, share that publicly. And the story I want to leave you with from my end today is this is back in 2016. I probably knew a few years before I had a problem with alcohol. I mean, as we talked about, fire in the eye, chip in the, on the shoulder, and uh, ultimately just addicts to the core, right? And thankfully, we've both basically taken the addiction and then framed it towards the positive. Mm -hmm. But for me, okay, I had an addiction with alcohol. And I remember vividly um, in one of my letters to you that I read on an annual basis, I finally kind of opened up and shared like, B, I have a problem with alcohol that I need to overcome. And I think, you know, having that, writing down that goal, writing down the objective that I want to accomplish and then finding someone, a mentor, someone I trusted, be able to showcase that for public accountability, that really gave me the vigor, the ambition, the, the fortitude to take that next step. And basically in this case, Make, make sure that I remo remove alcohol from my life, but it could be launching a business or launching a coaching program, whatever the case may be. But that served me really well, and I think a really tangible action step that I wanted to leave the audience with. So that's how I wanted to sign out. Anything else for you, B? Mm, I love that public accountability. That's it, man. We nailed it. And I think what people need to do now is not search for more information, yeah. but actually execute on the information that you already have and that's how you win in life amen to that my friends i know you got a ton of value drop a comment in the post i would love to hear from you also share this with someone who's on the fence who's being a entrepreneur but needs a kick in the ass because that's what we're here to do friends we'll see you in the next episode